Hello, this is Michael Peregrine of McDermott Health. Advising the board on conflicts of interest has long been a challenging part of the general counsel's responsibilities. And to help our clients address these challenges, we're offering a series of short vidcasts covering trends and conflicts of interest oversight. This first vidcast, the conflicts of interest puzzle, focuses on the many different legal issues implicated by conflicts. The fundamental challenge to effective conflicts identification and management is that it involves a real puzzle with six different pieces. Each piece relates to potential bias in the board's decision-making, and each piece is important to sustain board decisions. Ultimately, the conflicts identification and resolution process implicates important matters of law, ethics, and organizational process and should be the province of the general counsel and the compliance officer teaming together. The combination of the importance of the conflicts process and these leaders' other duties and responsibilities can make this a tall order if not supported by management and the board. Leadership needs to get the conflicts puzzle right. The point is to protect decisions from conflicts-related challenges, not just to remove the appearance or reality sometimes of officer and director bias from specific decisions. It also about protecting those officers and directors from reputational risks and reputational harm. The stakes have never been higher for effective conflicts management as a matter of corporate governance law. The standard of fiduciary conduct expected of officers and directors has grown materially with the size of health systems. And with their increasing size, with their more complex organizational portfolio, comes greater potential for conflicts to arise, which conflicts can have significant corporate, tax, and reputational implications. Importantly, risks arise from more than just pure matters of law. Allegations of conflict, whether accurate or not, are highly tempting fodder for investigative media inquiries. You've seen the headlines. Prominent companies, including nonprofits, aren't immune from this damaging coverage, regardless of the good they provide to their communities. And the perception or taint of conflict can ignite a where there's smoke, there must be fire perspective from some regulators. And it's not just the media that cares about officer and director conflicts. Conflicts are a prime focus of federal and state charity, insurance, and securities regulators. Unsecured creditors are likely to be agitated by indications that key board decisions were affected by conflict. Likewise, third-party interest and advocacy groups, which are often vocal critics of large healthcare organizations, will certainly take note. And rating agencies that follow the effectiveness of corporate governance will most certainly be concerned. There are others who care as well. DNO insurers tend to get agitated about extending coverage in situations involving alleged duty of loyalty violations. Vendors who are sensitive about losing out on contracts because of conflicts at the decision-making level will be concerned. Joint venture boards filled with directors who are employees of the respective venture members create huge conflicts headaches. And then there's the question of dissident directors and the internecine battles who are always ready to leverage conflicts allegations. To complete the conflicts of interest puzzle, let's spread all of the pieces out on the dining room table and take a look at them one by one. What do they involve and how do they fit together? This is the one everybody is familiar with. Financial, contractual, and similar relationships involving an officer or director that create the potential for bias in their decision making. This one's a little trickier, a little less obvious. It involves the universe of relationships between directors and their family members that could potentially bias the decision-making of one or both of those board members or officers, whether it's financial, personal, or whatever. This is the one that arises from part six of the form 990 and deals with relationships that could possibly lead to bias, but are sometimes overlooked as part of the board's annual conflicts disclosure form. Now, one of the hardest governance concepts to understand is how director independence differs from director conflict of interest. After all, they both deal to a certain extent with the issue of bias in the decision-making process. Yet one is more positional in nature, i.e. whether a director is independent of management, while the other is more episodic, whether a director with respect to a given decision coming before the board is actually or potentially biased. This is where it starts getting fairly confusing. 
when working through a compensation arrangement to determine the availability of the rebuttable presumption of reasonableness, a key factor is going to be whether the arrangement was approved by, quote, an authorized body of the organization consisting of individuals who were not conflicted. And of course, there are specific definitions of authorized body and conflict of interest for purposes of making this decision. But it gets more complex. The Form 990 on Schedule L requires information on certain financial transactions or arrangements between the organization and interested persons. The schedule is also used to determine whether a member of the organization's governing body is an independent member. Here's a policy question for the board and its conflicts committee. Will they focus primarily on relationships and arrangements that in the board or committee's determination create an actual conflict of interest? Or will they also focus on those relationships that are determined to create a potential conflict of interest? Going back to our puzzle analogy, it's the process of taking these six different but related pieces spread out on the table of board conflicts evaluation and making sure that they all fit together neatly and without having to use a hammer to make them fit. Because only when all the pieces are put neatly together will the general counsel and compliance officer be positioned to view the puzzle as the sum of its important parts and address the conflicts of interest issue comprehensively.